In 4.5, we're going to talk about global wind patterns. You want to know what environmental factors result in atmospheric circulation and how they do that. All right, so the big thing that starts it all is the difference in solar radiation. Um, so the most intense solar radiation is felt at the equator, whereas the least intense radiation is felt at the poles. And that has to do with the curvature of the Earth. So because um, sunlight is able to hit the equator directly, it heats it up more, versus the at the poles, because of that curve, it hits it indirectly. And you can actually test this out using a flashlight. So if you shine a flashlight directly on your desk, you'll see that it's a really bright white light. But then if you turn the flashlight sideways, then it's more spread out. It's the same amount of solar radiation, but again, the direction that affects how intense it is. So if there were no oceans and no, um, we didn't rotate, what we would see is two giant convection currents. And because the, the equator is getting a lot of heat, and as that air heats, it rises, becomes less dense. And then as it gets further up, it cools off, and then it sinks. Um, so we would see these one giant convection current from the equator to the poles. Uh, again, that has to do with how much direct heat is being felt. But it is more complicated than that. Uh, this is just another picture showing the convection cells if you're still kind of eh, about it, but I'm going to go on. So it becomes more complicated because, again, we have a lot of oceans and we are constantly spinning on our axis. So we end up with three major cells in both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Now it starts off just like I said before, uh, because the equators are very warm, that moist warm air rises and then as it cools it falls down. Um, so we see a lot of rain show up here, but I'll talk more about that in a second. Versus in the polar cell, as the polar cell, or as air in the polar cell um, flows downwards, it warms up and then it rises and then it cools up and falls. And so we actually see like these two major polar or major um, circulation cells. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> and then the feral cell kind of acts as like a gear between the two, transferring cold air from the top and then warm air from the equators and rotating back and forth. Um, so you do want to know that the Hadley is from 0 to 30 on both the north and south or southern hemisphere. The feral cell is in the 30 to 60, again, northern and feral, um, or northern and southern hemispheres. And then the poles go from 60 to 90, the polar cells. If we look at it from a side view, we can see a little bit better what's going on at each um, each latitude. So we see in the equator we have a lot of rain and that's because all this moisture um, is being heated up and creates all this rain but then by the time it gets up to the the tripopause and cools back down and falls all that rain is then lost. Um, and so we see an area of high pressure so this colder air sinks and falls but it has no moisture in it, or at least, again, this is relative. I'm not saying that everything at 30 degrees north doesn't get rain, because obviously that's not the case, because that's where we are. We get rain all the time. But I'm saying relative to these other latitudes, this 30 degree area does not get as much rain. And then we see, again, as it, um, it will pick moisture back up and then rise at the 60 degree north and south um, latitudes, and then get more rain, or snow as it were, since again it's further up, closer towards the pole, or precipitation is a better word to use for it. Um, I also like this picture because it shows again that we have the most rain near the, um, the 30 and the 60 degrees latitudes, because after all that, that rain has been dumped out, we have cool dry air descending and that's where our major deserts are, the 30 degree latitudes. In turn, if we look at a 
at a map and it's a little bit blurry, I'm sorry. Uh, that's generally where we see our major um, deserts. And again, it's not perfect. Like I said, it's not a hard, fast rule because there are a lot of other factors that impact weather, but just generally that's where we see our major deserts. Right, the Coriolis effect is a phenomenon that causes water and air to curve as they travel across Earth's surface. So basically, even though the Earth is all just like one big thing, it's, it's traveling us, uh, we're rotating at the, all the same time. Because it's a sphere, that means the it's, uh, it's smaller at the top and then wider at the, the center. So anything in the center has to move a lot faster than things at the poles. So for instance, if you and a friend somehow were able to stand at the pole and the, the equator and then hold a jump rope between the two of you, in order to keep that straight, at the if you're the guy at the pole, or the guy at the equator, you have to run a lot faster to keep up with the guy on top because you've got a lot more distance to cover. So because of this, we see that if something is traveling from the, the equator to the poles, because it's got a lot more mom momentum, because it's traveling a lot faster, as it's going towards the pole, it appears to be deflected. So if it's in the northern hemisphere, it gets deflected to the right, and if it's in the southern hemisphere, it appears to be deflected to the left. And then because of this, this is how we get um, storms that rotate in the way that they do. So let's say we're in the northern hemisphere where things are being deflected to the right. Well, in a storm, you have an area of low pressure in the center, so air is rushing towards that center. Um, so then as that air is rushing towards the center, it gets deflected to the right. And all that water, or all that air is being deflected to the right and to the right and to the right. And that comes um, together in, in one piece as a counterclockwise motion. And then we see the opposite happen in the southern hemisphere as the air is rushing towards the center, it gets deflected to the left. So if everything is deflected to the left, it ends up rotating in a clockwise manner. At the end of the day, if you don't understand how that happens or why that happens, that's fine. Just remember that things will deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. As best as you can, explain how environmental factors can result in atmospheric circulation.